Thank you for having me here. Brandon Woodworkers Club, I'm a new member. Also like to thank Rockler Woodworking Supplies for hosting this event. I work on historic homes and historic landmark buildings. What we try to do is preserve and restore history uh, in the form of old buildings, old architecture. I've been in business since 1974. What I find myself doing more and more of are windows. Unlike many of you who delve into the more artistic aspects of woodworking, if you want to consider anything about window making uh, exquisite, it's the joinery. They've got a molded profile, uh, a glass bed or a rabbit, a mortise and tenon joint, and then this is called a bridle joint up here. And it all goes together. I even, I even smeared some soap on the tenons so that they <laughs> slide in, but they are simply held in place with nails that I've cut off. This, this is a six penny nail, and I cut it to the thickness of this is one and three eighths, so I probably cut this nail at like one and one eighth. That's the nice thing about this, you can take it apart. That is exactly, historically, how they've been uh, manufactured. They never glued the joints. When I put the glass in, the glass is perfectly square. Therefore, my sash is going to be perfectly square. So I've got a little gap down here at the bottom. There's a little bit of excess. So I'm going to put what's called some furniture. Any place I see a gap, I'll put a toothpick. Down here I'm going to put a matchstick. <laughs> then what's going to hold that glass in are these little glazing points. They're called push points. This is called easy point. And it's just a little metal sharp metal uh, point that will hold the uh, glass in place, at least temporarily, until we can put some glazing compound in there. And for a window this size, we'll need about six or eight of them just to secure the glass wherever I put a piece of furniture, that is a toothpick or a matchstick, I'm going to drive a glazing point in to keep that in place. I'm going to take some of this uh, whiting powder, calcium carbonate is all it is. And what we've been using for window putty all these years is pretty much the same thing that uh, was around a couple hundred years ago, it's really nothing but linseed oil and powdered chalk. Go all the way around the perimeter of the window. Some people like to push it in place like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes I actually put this in the microwave oven to get it a little more workable. Anyway, it's been sitting in the truck and it's relatively stiff, but nonetheless workable all the same. I will go all the way around the perimeter of this window we want to make sure that we have it pressed in and uh, starting in the corner we'll just take away the excess. It's important to make sure your corners are neatly struck. So when you're doing that, are you working it down into the little gap around the, the glass in the frame? Yeah, actually when I was pressing it in, it uh, okay. should have found itself. Any, any gap that uh, occurred will um, be filled. That's why you have to press it in pretty good, because if you don't, it's like a lot of guys they push it in like this and it really doesn't get into every crevice. 
I have two putty knives. I have a straight one and I have a bent one. The bent one comes in handy when you're working up on a ladder because there's a lot of things that uh, will obstruct you from using the straight knife. When you look through it, you don't want to see any putty here like I just left here. So I'm going to go over it again. And the purpose of those metal points that I put in they're going to hold the glass in place until the putty dries, which takes about six weeks, in all honesty. Do you have a question? Yes. Is there a trick to taking out old putty? Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm glad you reminded me. Thank you. This is a charcoal starter. This thing gets red hot, and there's no switch on it, so it's kind of a dangerous thing to work with. So don't ever use it indoors. And always make sure you have a cinder block or a brick to set it on. But this gets red hot, and you can melt the putty out using this just by patiently going all the way around it. This is the only thing that I know of that will fit the bill. If I were using it on a workbench like this or up on a ladder, I'd have a fan blowing on me because I don't want to breathe the smoke either. What I thought I'd do tonight is instead of putting a window together, I'm going to take one apart. This is your uh, typical window. They haven't changed much in 300 years. Every house before 1960 would have had window screens because people just didn't have air conditioning back before that. So this is just a typical window screen held in place with what's called a screen hanger. And there's a hook and eye lock on the back. This particular customer travels part of the year. So he's worried about security. Uh, so what we've done is convert a rather simple window screen to a storm window by putting this plate glass in here and that's held in place by turning these little thumb turns and then to add a measure of security we have an additional little feature it's called a hitch pin and there's a corresponding eye bolt that will go on the inside of the frame uh, the jam consists of a window jam, a piece of parting stop, and this is what separates the upper sash from the lower sash. On the outside, we have an exterior stop, and it's just a piece of one by two. Couldn't be simpler. The windows are counterbalanced with window weights, such as you see on the floor, and this rope attaches to the side of the sash by a knot. When I get to somebody's house, they're usually painted shut. Uh, once you get the thing apart and you get the sashes out, it's really not very difficult to uh, get into the, the weight cavity. The inside of the window in appearance will be very much as you see the outside, um, except there would be, instead of this, up here you would have a more ornamental element that would go around the top. This is actually called a window stool and uh, that would go down at the bottom and the interior casings would drop onto the top of this just as you see them doing on the exterior sill. And this is a uh, piece of flashing which would get tucked up behind a piece of lap siding. Uh, we don't want any water to get behind it and uh, cause damage. It's just 26 gauge and I have them custom made. That sits on top of this cap which is called a drip cap and the purpose of this is to deflect the water so I want this to stick out further than this so that any water that runs off of the flashing won't splash on the sill. I want it to go away from the house as much as possible. The exterior casing is in this case a one by six. Usually there would be a nail either coming up from the bottom or I would toenail it to keep it from doing this. But I have a, uh, a little biscuit up at the top so to keep this flush. The exterior casing actually provides the pocket 
for the screen to fit into. Uh, I think you can learn just as much from me taking it apart. Um, these would have been traditionally made out of yellow pine. Pine always look for mature, dense growth. But, uh, here we have, this is the outside stop. The window is counterbalanced with a weight that goes up and down in a weight cavity. Precisely in that manner. This is what uh, goes around the inside called perimeter stop. So here, our lower sash comes out. The upper sash goes up and down just as the lower sash. Is there enough variability in the weight of the sashes that you have to adjust the weight of the... They're, they're pretty close. However, the upper sash is usually one inch less in height than the... Uh, lower one so uh, but you want the upper sash to stay up so if you have dissimilar weights the heavier one believe it or not goes on the upper sash here's how they go together and this is called a check rail here and uh, you want this to you want this to level off with the upper sash they overlap by about one and three eighths of an inch in the middle. But the lower sash measures 34 and the upper sash measures 33. Yeah, but the glass size is exactly the same. This is also pressure treated. And but it's a piece of two by six that I have cut a, a 10 degree bevel on this side to conform to the 10 degree bevel on the finish sill. There we go. As I said earlier, this is the, the jam segment and uh, it's no different than the piece I showed you earlier. Uh, you know, I don't think I mentioned on the other that there's a deliberate slope of 10 degrees on the bottom and uh, <clears throat> The head jam fits in in such a way as to house those sashes to the dimension required for them to uh, overlap in the middle or as they say, check. That's called a check rail and when your windows are in check, they're perfectly leveled off. This is the finish sill. Bear in mind it slopes at a 10 degree angle. Yeah, let's go back to our window stool. Like I mentioned earlier, this goes on the inside. You have to notice another <coughs> tricky little cut is this undercut here. Uh, it's cut at a 10 degree angle. Yeah. And that fits right here. So when this is at 10 degrees, this is level on the inside. And that is what the uh, inside casing drops right onto this. Well, this builder has specified insulation. They've closed down the width of the windows, and so there's no room for the weights. So we're gonna have to put an alternative balance system in to keep the windows up. These are called balance tubes. It gets mounted on the inside of the jam. There's a little fluted spiral rod and uh, you tension that with a tool it's like a little a little torque wrench it's called a charger and um, depending on how many turns you give that determines the strength of the spring and it, believe me it's more than enough to but my balance to is going to be fastened near the top, doesn't take much, just a little one and a half inch long screw. Of course, there's two sashes, so you have two balance tubes. And these, these are about 13 bucks a piece. It's very thrifty, very affordable, and very effective. And honestly, I can assure you a life of show business is not for me. <laughs> but uh, 
what we're trying to do here in Tampa with the Historical Society is pass our skills on to the next generation so that they can become the stewards of history. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Our job was to replace that. That's it. That's correct.